Greetings from Cooperstown, New York, on this first ever official Lou Gehrig Day, June 2nd, 2021. We're very glad you could join us for a special program. We will talk to one of the leading experts on the subject of Lou Gehrig, and that is the critically acclaimed author, Jonathan Eig. We'll take your questions for Jonathan a bit later on and really get into some depth on the subject of one of our Hall of Famers, first baseman, American hero, role model, uh, one of the more fascinating people in the history of baseball. And that's uh, all going to be coming up. We do want to remind folks that this program, along with all of our other regular virtual programs, brought to you through the generous support of the Ford Motor Company. We do thank them for making these opportunities possible. That's why we're able to offer them to you free of charge. Once again, we uh, will be welcoming our guest today, Lou Gehrig Day and part of the virtual author series. His name is Jonathan I. Jonathan has written five standout books, uh, including Luckiest Man, The Life and Death of Lou Gehrig, but he's also written about Jackie Robinson, uh, also wrote about a very different character named uh, Al Capone, uh, has written a book about the great boxer Muhammad Ali, currently working on a project on civil rights leader uh, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. We should mention that Jonathan is familiar to us here in Cooperstown for another reason. Uh, 16 years ago, he was the keynote speaker at our 2005 Cooperstown Symposium on Baseball and American Culture, and he talked about his book. He talked about Lou Gehrig that day. We welcome Jonathan, back to uh, the airwaves here at the Hall of Fame in Cooperstown. Jonathan, thank you very much. How are you doing? I'm good, Bruce. Thanks again for having me. I wish I could be with you in Cooperstown today. 16 years ago, you were here. I imagine you still remember a lot about uh, delivering a nice speech in front of the Grandstand Theater. That was a magical experience for me as a huge lifetime baseball fan and um, an occasional visitor to the Hall of Fame to get to speak there. Um, was was amazing. I was uh, really humbled. Do you get nervous at all about speaking? You know, your forte is writing. I mean, that's that's what you do so very well. Um, when you're asked to do something like deliver a speech in front of a live audience, especially in front of um, some very smart academic folks who uh, might be willing to correct any factual errors that you could make, <laughs> uh, was that a bit nerve wracking for you? Yeah, especially the Cooperstown Symposium. Those are some serious experts. And, uh, you know, I come into this thing knowing very little about someone like Gehrig and then having to get up to speed and having to make myself the world's leading expert or one of the world's leading experts. So it's intimidating. And and in the beginning, I was very scared about, about talking in front of audiences. I got used to it. I've gotten better at it. And, and I've learned to not take it personally. The fact that people correct me on my errors just means that they care. And, uh, you know, baseball fans are great for that. We want to mention some of the available outlets where you can pick up the book. It did come out in 2005, but still very much in print. You can find Luckiest Man, The Life and Death of Lou Gehrig at Amazon.com, also at BarnesandNoble.com, and Jonathan has his own website as well. It's at JonathanEig.com, J-O-N, a-T-H-A-N-E-I-G, jonathanig.com. And for those who have not read the book, we encourage you to do so. It did win the Casey Award as the best baseball book of 2005. Jonathan, today we celebrate the first official Lou Gehrig Day, although I guess in a way it's the second because there was a Lou Gehrig Day that was celebrated at Yankee Stadium way back in 1939 on the 4th of July. But this is the first one designated by Major League Baseball. Do you think this decision to create an official Garrick Day uh, starting here in 2021, was it simply because of the 80th anniversary of his death? Or do you think there might have been some other factors that led to the timing such as it is? I think the biggest factor is the, the longtime um, lobbying of the ALS community for such a day, for such an honor. Uh, Garrick even now, 80 years after his death, means so much to people with ALS and to the family members of people with ALS because he helped the world get to know this disease. It was, you know, it's, it's, it's not a uh, very common disease. It's too common, but it, it doesn't hit a whole lot of people. And those people tend not to live too long. Um, you know, a year or two is about average um, for how long you can survive with ALS. 
and um, nobody survives it, nobody beats it. So there's not a huge community of people out there advocating for ALS research and ALS um, funding. So Gehrig really still matters to the ALS community. He's a way to, to bring awareness for this disease, a way to raise more money for it. And, and people in the ALS community have been pushing for a long time to get Major League Baseball to, to do more to recognize Gehrig. And I think for them, this is a huge day and a huge victory. And, and it's just um, a result of years and years of hard work on their part to make it happen. Certainly, Jonathan, there's been some progress made in the fight against ALS. Some of the treatments that we've seen even in recent years um, have shown some, some hope uh, for the future. Is there a feeling within the ALS community that they're, they're on the cusp of a breakthrough? Uh, is it possible? Do they think that we could have a cure in the next 20 to 30 years? Well, the sad thing is that we, you know, people who are diagnosed today are really having experiences not very different from Lou's. Um, the, the, the treatment, the understanding of the disease um, only gradually, only, you know, incrementally improved in the 80 years since Gehrig's time. But we do understand um, the science behind it a lot better. We do um, understand some of the, um, you know, the genetics behind it. I think we are certainly getting much closer to a cure and, um, I'm optimistic that we will see um, big time progress in the next 20 years. But then again, Gehrig thought the same thing. Gehrig really thought that that he would live to see this disease um, defeated. And and he was using some of the same experimental treatments that people today are using. It's 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 um, it's a tough one to figure out. Jonathan, would we be accurate in saying that at the time Gehrig was diagnosed spring, summer of um, 1939, Virtually nothing was known publicly. Most people have not even heard of ALS. Is that accurate? Yeah, that's absolutely accurate. And there was a great deal of misunderstanding when Gehrig was, uh, gave the news and he came back from the Mayo Clinic um, you know, with a letter from the doctors and, and released it to the press. Um, people really didn't understand. Um, they'd never heard of this. They thought it might be like polio. And they thought that, you know, he might be um, limited by this, that he might be forced to walk with a cane or, you know, use a wheelchair. But a lot of people didn't really believe that it was that it was fatal. And, I, and in fact, there were even, you know, reports that it might be contagious. And, and the Daily News reported a story saying that the reason the Yankees were slumping at that time was that they had all caught the disease from Lou. And, you know, ALS is not contagious. But there was so much misunderstanding at the time that it really um, it really hurt. Um, public awareness. And, and I think it hurt Gehrig because to, to see in the newspaper this this false report that, that he uh, infected his own teammates mm. really, really damaged him and, and really upset him tremendously. I remember seeing a newspaper headline that said Gehrig was diagnosed with infantile paralysis. That's right. Uh, again, it was misunderstood and people yeah. thought that this was like polio. Um, and that was polio was something that was very well understood and um, was people were very scared of polio. So um, they took one word from the press release um, and, and, and misunderstood it. As, and as a result, that kind of caught on just because it was easier for folks to latch on to. This whole idea that it might've been contagious, how long did it take before that misconception finally got corrected? I think it happened pretty quickly because the you know the slump ended and the you know the Yankees went back to winning and nobody else on the team caught ALS and Gehrig actually sued the Daily News and won a libel mm -hmm. suit. Um, so uh, I think that uh, people um, got learned and that's again getting back to how important Gehrig was to the ALS community then and now. Um, if it weren't for his high profile and his willingness to talk about his disease, to, to stand up in front of 61,000 people on Lou Gehrig Day in 1939 and to acknowledge um, you know, that, 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 this had, that, that he was dying, that um, made a big difference because people began to really um, come to terms with this and, and um, people began to understand it in a way that they hadn't before. Jonathan, let's talk about the impetus for writing the book so many years ago. And I want to talk a little bit about your own motivations. I understand that you grew up as a Yankee fan. Your hero was the same hero that I had. We're about the same age. We both grew up in the early 70s. You loved Bobby Mercer. I loved Bobby Mercer as well. So I guess that's how it got started. Some commonality with the Yankee franchise. 
Yeah, I love the Yankees. I love Mercer. I loved, uh, you know, Roy White, Ron Bloomberg, those teams. Um, and then, of course, you begin to learn about the history. And there are these Mount Rushmore figures um, from the Yankee glory days. And, and that Mount Rushmore would probably be, uh, you know, Ruth, Mantle, DiMaggio, Gehrig. And Gehrig's the one that I paid the least attention to as a kid. Um, and I think that a lot of us overlooked Lou. And even during his playing career, a lot of the fans overlooked Lou because he was quiet because he uh, didn't call a lot of attention to himself. He played the game in a very professional, dignified way. Um, you know, the, the reason he, he earned the nickname the Iron Horse was because he was like a train. He just showed up every day, chugging and chugging. Um, and, and the thing about a train, as I, as I wrote in the book, is that you, you take it for granted. You just assume it's always going to be there until the one day that it doesn't show up. And that's when you begin to appreciate it. So Gehrig, um, to me, was the least interesting of those Mount Rushmore Yankees until I got to, into my thirties and realized that, uh, you know, he died at 37 and that's mind blowing. Right. But as a kid, um, that doesn't hit you as hard. So it was when I got to be in my mid thirties and thought about Gehrig's story differently that I first began to think about writing about him. Here we have some photos of Lou as a baby and then as a young boy growing up in New York city. He was the son of German immigrants, his mother, Christina, his father, Heinrich. Two-part question, Jonathan. Was he brought up to speak German more so than English? And also, is it true that as a youngster, he was bullied by other kids? Yeah. Um, yes and yes. He spoke German in the home, um, spoke it fluently all his life. Um, but because he was a, a, you know, an immigrant, because he was in school and um, out in the world of New York, he um, going to, you know, very multicultural schools, he, you know, he grew up speaking English um, and learning to read and write in English. I don't think he could read and write in German, but I'm not sure about that. Um, and he was bullied because he was fat. And you can see in that picture on the right, he's a chunky little kid. And um, one of the reasons I think for his, um, and, and he was also bullied because he was, he was such a mama's boy. Mm. He, he was not allowed to, to run around the city with the same sense of freedom that a lot of other kids had because his mother was so worried about him. And because Lou was so concerned about ever disappointing his mother. And the big key to that is that Gehrig was the only one of four children to survive. He lost three siblings and um, that had to just be devastating. You can only imagine how hard his parents must have taken that. And Lou lived all of his life, I think, with the fear of ever disappointing his mother. And, and um, that's, uh, that's one of the, the big factors in shaping his personality. You know, you mentioned that photograph on the right. Whenever I see that, you know who it reminds me of? It actually reminds me of Spanky from The Little Rascals. <laughs> he looks like that character. Yeah, uh, the same round face. Um, yeah. But, you know, Gary, of course, grew up to be an incredibly big, strong and handsome guy. Although you know, his first nickname was Fat, very simple. Wow. And then his second nickname in, in high school and even in college was Biscuit Pants because he had mm. such a large rear end. Um, so it, it didn't start very promisingly. Um, you know, he was, he was not the great Bambino. He was not the Sultan of Swat. He was biscuit pants. <laughs> so the reasons for the bullying had to do with his physique, his mother being overly protective. How about it being a German immigrant? Was that a factor too in the bullying? Yeah. Although I think in New York, there were so many immigrants. Um, you know, he actually grew up on the same block where my great grandfather had a little, um, grocery store. And I think that um, the German immigrant thing definitely would have affected him during the war years at World War I. Um, but generally in New York, I, I don't think that was the biggest of his problems because there were so many immigrant families all around him. And he was such a quiet kid that I imagine he didn't really feel motivated to argue back or fight back in any way. No, he wasn't much of a fighter and he just preferred to uh, be left alone. And, um, but, but he did take his, his sports very seriously and he did take his, his body very seriously. He, I think he compensated um, for his, you know, his deficiencies or for his insecurities by building up his body. At a time when people really didn't go to the gym and lift weights, um, Gehrig did go with his father to the uh, local gymnasium and learn to do you know, gymnastics and learn to really start um, putting on muscle. And you can see that in the pictures of him from high school and college. He's a monster. He's twice as big as the other kids on the team. Um, 
you know, the picture on, I believe the picture on the right is high school. Um, I'm not sure about the picture on the left, but you know, he went to Commerce High and then on to Columbia University, never left New York, couldn't ever bear to go far from his mother. Um, but look at how big and strong and, and handsome he is now. Nobody's calling him fat anymore. Yeah, that picture on the right, I would have guessed college years, but uh, you may indeed be right that that was maybe later in high school. And then the picture on the left, I think, is from Columbia when he played football. He was actually a terrific high school football player, and he was recruited by Columbia Ivy League School. He was given a football scholarship, not a baseball scholarship. I'm curious, how much did you delve into his football career? How good was he at football? Was he good enough to make the pros at that time? Oh, yeah, he almost certainly was good enough to make the pros. Um, he was a, a cannonball. He just, you know, you look at the size of those legs, even as a teenager, um, he would just barrel through the line. He was also a great punter. Um, I think there's no question that he would have, um, you know, been able to play professionally, but professional football at the time wasn't much of a, wasn't much of an enterprise. Um, there wasn't much money to be made and it, it didn't, uh, you know, baseball w offered much more um, professional opportunity. And that's why uh, when the baseball scouts came along, he never gave a second thought to, to the possibility of playing football. Baseball was the American uh, pastime. Baseball was a big business. Baseball, you could make enough money in one season to, um, you know, to, to, top your, your parents' lifetime earnings. So um, it was a no-brainer once the baseball scouts began looking at him. So it made more sense in terms of a career choice. Do we know if he liked baseball better than football, just playing it? You know, I'm not sure. I think he probably liked football better. Um, mm -hmm. If you're just going by his, his early interests. Um, but again, the opportunities were so great in baseball that um, I, I don't think he had to even think about it. What was his primary position in football? Was it a tailback? Yeah, he was a running back. Um, but he, as, as, as was common in those days, you know, he moved around a lot, probably played some defense too. And, yeah. and he did a lot of the kicking for the team too. Looked like he could have handled some linebacking as well, if that was uh, needed. I want to talk about a very important aspect of Lou's life. And it was his family on several different fronts. Here's a great photograph of you know, the three people he was so close to on the far left. Uh, we see his mother, Christina, uh, on the far right, his father, Heinrich, and then in between himself and Heinrich, uh, the woman that he would marry, Eleanor Twitchell. Um, I believe they were married by the time this photograph was taken. We know that he was very, very close to his mother. And I want to talk more about that in a moment, but I've always heard very little about the relationship with his father, Heinrich. What was that relationship like? You know, it's, it's unfortunate that we never really got to hear Heinrich's side of the story because um, Christina told the story most often and, and Eleanor, you know, lived long and wrote books and, and told her side of the story. And, and Heinrich generally gets portrayed as a guy who drank too much, didn't have a steady job, um, suffered from epilepsy, so uh, may have, that may have affected his ability to work steadily. Um, and, and Gary is such, a, as I said, such a mama's boy and so obsessed with pleasing his mother and, you know, goes to work as an early, at an early age, helping his mother with her, with her laundry business um, and, and really um, kind of forms this alliance to the detriment of, uh, of, of Pops Gehrig, who is kind of uh, left out of the, of the story, left out of the picture. Uh, you know, I think that he, um, he kind of falls by the wayside in the tellings of these stories. And, and I've, I wish that somebody could have sat down and gotten his side of the story, but I don't think anyone ever did. So this incredible work ethic that Lou had probably doesn't come from the father's side. No, definitely not. It definitely comes from his mother because, um, you know, Ma Gehrig not only, um, you know, cleaned and fed for her family, she cleaned and fed for other families. And then she went and got a job, um, you know, a full-time job as a, as a housekeeper on the Columbia University campus. So think about that. You know, Lou gets scholarship offers from lots of schools, um, including some others in the New York region where he wouldn't have had to go too far from home. But he chooses to go to school on the campus where his mother is working as a maid. Um, you know, most kids at the age of 18 would want to escape from their parents. And, and here he has an opportunity to leave town or at least not go to the same school where your mother works as a maid. And not only does he go to the Columbia, um, but as he becomes the, the star of the football team and the star of the baseball team, where he could be out every night having a good time, 
meeting up beautiful girls, partying with the boys. No, he goes to the frat house where his mother works and helps her clean up the kitchen, helps mm. her prepare food for these other guys. He's so humble and he's so dedicated to his mother that he sacrifices his social life for her. Co- sacrifices really, you know, all of the fun that um, a good looking athlete like Lou should be having in college um, and, and never once complains about it. And he never changed, even with success. He always remained grounded, always remained loyal to her, correct? Yeah, I mean, some people would say, you know, he, he always remained, uh, you know, hopelessly tied by the umbilical cord to his mother, because even when he's, you know, now it's the Roaring Twenties, right? And he's on the Yankees. He's the best looking young single man in, in professional sports in the city of New York. And he's not going out at night with the boys He's going home every night to help his mother prepare dinner, and he wants no part of the social life. Um, and and he, he brings his mother to spring training. Um, you know, again, another opportunity to, to have a little fun. Um, no, Gehrig is he is uh, it's it's remarkable. It, it's it, it it boggles my mind even now to think about how um, com- completely committed he was to his mom. And it made it very hard for Eleanor, who we can talk about now or later, made it very hard for Eleanor to, 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 to break into that picture and to, and to win Lou's attention and his affection because she had to tear him away from, from Ma Gehrig. Mm. Did he and Christina, did they, did they butt heads whenever maybe Lou felt she was being too intrusive, too protective, uh, or did he always seem to accept that? Uh, butting heads is um, putting it mildly. This was the, the biggest issue in their marriage. Um, and it almost, you know, ended the marriage before it began because when they were engaged, Lou and Eleanor um, separated briefly because Lou said that he wanted to live with, continue to live with his parents. He wanted the, uh, the, the two couples to live together. And Eleanor said, that's a deal breaker. So <laughs> Lou had to decide, you know, whether he wanted to be married or whether he want, you know, if he was going to be married, um, he had to commit to moving out of his parents' house. He was, he was 30 years old at this point, mm. crying out loud. And uh, he still wasn't sure that he ever really wanted to move out of his, out of his parents' house. Um, but um, thankfully, I think for, for Lou, um, you know, he chose Eleanor and took that big step and moved out. But he, he, did, he did move just down the block so that he could still visit Ma, you know, every day. Jonathan, how is it that Lou and Eleanor first met? They met in Chicago um, during the World Series when the Yanks were playing the Cubs, uh, that famous World Series when, you know, Babe Ruth's may or may not have pointed out, pointed to center field before hitting the home run. Um, mm-hmm. Gehrig was at a party uh, and it's rare that he went to parties, but somehow he was convinced to go to a party. And, and that's where he met Eleanor Twitchell, a Chicago girl um, who, um, you know, now that the Great Depression was, was hitting, um, really was looking to settle down. She didn't want to party as much anymore. And um, Lou was instantly smitten. Uh, in fact, you know, um, started sending her expensive gifts in the mail after just having met her. And um, by the time they met for the second time, the following season, uh, he was ready to propose marriage after just, you know, basically, you know, one date. Uh, but but uh, maybe he recognized that if he was going to break away from from his mo- mother, he had to do it quickly. Like there was no there was no time to be to, to do this Subtly, no gradualism allowed. So did Eleanor say, hey, Lou, let's slow down. We've only had a couple of dates here. What was her reaction? No, Eleanor was ready to go. Um, yeah. she, she knew that she, this was her man. And she also knew that um, she was going to have to fight hard to get him to uh, break away from, from his mother. So she was all in and ready to fight. And Eleanor was a fighter. She was a tough woman, um, very much... Um, you know, a, a symbol of the Roaring Twenties, where women began to um, put themselves out a little more forcefully. You know, she she smoked and drank, and um, you know, saw herself as as a as a worldly woman capable of of running, um, you know, her husband's business affairs. Um, really, um, you know, a, a new generation of woman for that time. Was it a case that Eleanor and Christina they just didn't like each other, or was? It's simply a situation where they each resented the other maybe intruding on their role. I think it's a little bit of both. And, you know, there's a little bit more background to the story in that um, Christina knew that, that Eleanor was one of the girls who went to Yankee parties. They called them circuit girls at the time. 
And she knew what that meant. She knew that it, she thought that that meant that um, that Eleanor was was loose, that she was a you know a a playgirl, and and that she that also meant that perhaps she'd slept with Babe Ruth or some of the other guys on the team because that's what the circuit girls were known for. So Christina immediately was prejudiced against Eleanor, thinking that she was just not good enough for her Louis. And uh, you know it's pos possible that no one would have been good enough for her Louis. Yeah. But this gave her a reason to really look down on Eleanor. She thought that she was too tawdry for her for her boy. Did Eleanor eventually win over Christina to an extent? No, never. It only no. got worse. And and when mm -hmm. Lou got sick, um, it really got worse because the women um, blamed each other. Um, Eleanor um, banned Christina from the house. Um, said that she, she she never wanted to see her again. And um, they, they fought over everything. And the illness, um, you know, it's, ALS is a tough disease for the families to, to go through, for anyone to go through. Um, and um, it just drove a, 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 an even greater wedge between Christina and Eleanor. Mm. No, that's sad. I'd, I'd never realized that. Eleanor rather famously never remarried. And I think she was asked about it once and paraphrasing here, but she said something to the effect of, well, it's it's hard to find someone to match Lou Gehrig. Yeah, I remember as a kid seeing her at Old Timers Day um, at Yankee Stadium. She and, and um, Babe Ruth's wife would wave to the crowd and, um, you know, it, it, it occurs to me that, you know, um, she she had a lot of years left and she um, she never did remarry. She, she just, I guess she felt it was important to carry on Lou's legacy and she dedicated herself to that. Now, Christina and Heinrich, um, I want to say they died a few years later, maybe 1940s, 1950s. Um, if I'm wrong on that, please correct me. I, I'm just, I'm wondering, do, do we know how devastated his mother was by Lou's passing, given they were so close, she was so protective of him. I mean, it, it, I always hear nightmare stories about parents losing a child. Um, and even though Lou was, was not a child at this point, he was still very young and it was such a devastating thing. W was this an absolute crusher for Christina? I mean, did this, did this essentially ruin her for the rest of her days? Well, I wouldn't be able to say whether it ruined her. I, I can, obviously it was, it would have been devastating um, for anyone to lose a child. It's devastating when you've lost four children and you have none left. I can only imagine, you know, the pain for her and for and for Heinrich, I can only imagine how they coped. And then, um, you know, it didn't help that um, the feud between she and Eleanor continued, and that you know, as these things were done to honor Lou, um, as a movie is being made, um, as the, you know the Hall of Fame is is um, recognizing him, um, Eleanor is not letting um, Ma and Pa Gehrig participate in any of those uh, events. And in fact, you know, mm -hmm. Eleanor really kind of worked to to make sure that Ma Gehrig was portrayed unkindly in the in the Gary Cooper movie Pride of the Yankees. So it's it's a tough, tough story. Uh, I really feel for them all. Somebody asked me this the other day and I didn't really have a good answer. Someone asked, are there any survivors within the Garrick family? Lou and Eleanor never had any children. As you mentioned, none of the other uh, children to Christina and Heinrich survived. Are there any Garricks left? No, there are only some very distant cousins. Um, you know, um, Eleanor didn't, Eleanor had one brother. Um, so there aren't even any nieces or nephews um, that I, that I know of. It's, um, it was, uh, it was, it made it hard for me in my research to, to try to find people who knew Garrick or knew um, any of the family history um, but um, there are really now only a, a handful of distant relatives who, you know, basically by examining their family trees have realized that they're related to Gary, but don't have any um, stories or any, um, you know, connections that they can speak of. Let's talk about the relationship of these two great players. I mean, for years, they were back to back in the order. You had Ruth batting third, playing right field most of the time. Garrick, of course, every day at first base batting cleanup, batting fourth right behind uh, Babe Ruth. Uh, I guess initially they were friends. Lou looked up to Babe as this incredible ball player, uh, uh, maybe a hero, if you will. 
But then came the rift, apparently after Lou married Eleanor. Exactly what caused this strain between the babe and Lou? Yeah, let me say, first of all, that they were really close. And um, Gehrig looked up to the babe as a big brother. And the babe really liked having a little brother. You know, the babe was was more or less an orphan and grew up in an orphanage. And um, the fact that he could go to Lou's house and enjoy this great German cooking and, and speak German. Gehrig, uh, Ruth also grew up speaking German. Um, you know, the, the Gehrig dinner table became like a second home for, for the babe. And mm. um, they were, you know, an odd pair, um, but th I think they really loved each other. And, and you know, the babe, um, you know, had um, had plenty of other distractions, but you know he chose to spend time with with the Garrigs. Chose to go there for dinner, and and of course, you know when they went barnstorming in the off seasons, it was the two of them. They were the stars of the show. They spent an incredible amount of time together, just the two of them on trains. Think how much time they passed together on trains and in hotel rooms, and and how well they got to know each other. So and and, and Gehrig never really changed who he was. He never, you know, um, joined Babe for the parties. And, and Babe still, you know, respected Lou and his decision to, to be himself. And it takes a lot of strength to, um, to, to, to not stand up to that, to stand up to that kind of peer pressure. Um, and, and I think that they had a, you know, really warm friendship with it, where they respected their differences. Um, but then Eleanor came along and things got, got messy. And um, the story that Fred Lieb told, Fred Lieb was the sports writer um, who knew, probably knew Gehrig the best, is that... Um, Lou and Eleanor were on their, their honeymoon. Um, Gehrig was famously cheap and didn't take a real honeymoon, waited until the postseason when the Yankees were invited to go barnstorming in Japan and um, decided to make that the honeymoon. And on, their sh on the ship on the way over to Japan, um, he couldn't find Eleanor anywhere. I went looking all over the place. Um, Fred Lieb was on the boat, so it tells the story with some firsthand knowledge. And uh, finally, after really becoming worried that maybe she'd, you know, fallen overboard, mm. um, Lou finds um, Eleanor in the babe's cabin, drunk. Um, and Eleanor tells this story herself in her memoir. So um, the fact that Eleanor includes this in her memoir makes me think that it's likely true. And um, she says they were, you know, dressed, fully dressed in bed, drinking, sh on the bed, drinking champagne. Um, Maybe there was more to it than that, that Eleanor decided not to include in her account. Mm -hmm. um, but that when Lou found her there, he became outraged. And um, that was the breaking point that after that, um, he and Babe stopped speaking to each other. And, and if you in fact, if you look at the films from Yankee games, um, all up until that moment, every time Gehrig um, stood at the home, at home plate to greet Ruth after a home run. And as you said, Ruth batted third, Gehrig batted fourth. So Ruth hits a home run, trots around the bases, crosses home plate, there's Gehrig ready to shake his hand. But after that moment, after the, um, the incident on the ship, um, Gehrig no longer shakes Ruth's hand uh, when, when he crosses home plate. Hmm. And, and they really don't speak to each other again um, until, you know, until really, until Gehrig um, retires and, and when it's clear that he's ill, then, then he and, and Ruth um, reconnect finally. Now, just to clarify, when Garrick went into the cabin, it, or uh, Eleanor was not alone with Ruth. Mrs. Ruth was there too, correct? Mrs. Ruth was there too, right. Yeah. So um, it was either like a really wild uh, party with three of them going at it, or they were just drinking and Lou, that was enough to, to upset Lou. We really don't know. It sounds more like Garrick was upset with Ruth than the other way around. Yeah, Ruth never got upset with anybody for long. The, yeah. the grudge would not have um, lasted if it had just been up to Ruth, but Gehrig was upset. Um, Gehrig felt betrayed and, and he couldn't really take it out on Eleanor, I guess, because um, clearly Eleanor um, bears some responsibility for this, um, not just the babe, but um, you know, it was, they still had the rest of their honeymoon to go through and yeah. uh, Lou chose to take out his anger on the babe. Did Ruth and Gehrig ever reconcile after this? Well, when Gehrig announced his retirement, announced that he was sick, you know, the babe came and gave him a big hug um, on the field during the ceremony. And um, you can see the, uh, the affection in their, both of their eyes. Lou looks a little hesitant, yeah. but, um, but I think that they, they, they I, don't, I don't know that they ever spent much time together again, but it, it, I, I like to think that they forgave each other. And it appears they probably spoke at least a few words that day. Yeah, and when um, news came that Gehrig had, had passed away, 
um, Ruth in the middle of the night got up and drove to the house and, you know, wanted mm -hmm. to be there to pay his respects and offer his sympathies to Eleanor. Um, Lou, I mean, the babe never stayed mad for yeah. anybody for very long. Let's talk about 1938 and 39, Jonathan. Uh, that's when Lou really, for the first time in his career, starts slumping. He's not only struggling at the plate, he's making mistakes in the field. Um, and then as we move into spring of 1939, it's clear that he's lost weight. Um, he's not only falling down on the field, but he's falling down just in, in regular day-to-day -day life. Um, he apparently is coming down with blisters on his hands. So there starts to be an indication that maybe this is just more than old age settling in for a baseball player who's, you know, 36 years of age, 35 years of age. Maybe there's something a lot more serious going on. Yeah, let me just um, correct one thing. I don't think it's fair to say he was slumping. I think he was he was fighting to maintain his performance as the symptoms of ALS were beginning to hit his body. And um, what happened in 1938 to me is one of the greatest performances in the history of baseball, because we now know with almost, uh, you know, a hundred percent certainty that he played that entire season with ALS. Wow. Um, you can see it in spring training when mm -hmm. he starts complaining about blisters on his hands. And when he's, he's playing golf on one of his days off, and you know his cleats get caught on the turf um, because his his feet aren't lifting as much as they as they normally would lift. And these are some of the very first signs of of ALS. I think the the blisters are a result of the fact that he's he's compensating for the muscle loss in his hands by squeezing the bat harder. Yeah. And as the season goes along, he's constant, he's talking to reporters about it. He says something doesn't feel right, but of course he has no idea what it is. And um, even you know it starts adjusting his batting stance, starts ordering lighter bats. You know, I went through um, the, the records at Louisville Slugger Company and found that, you know, he started reducing the weight of his bats, uh, you know, half an ounce at a time, month by month as the season went along. So he sensed that something was happening to his body and couldn't figure out what it was. And he goes on, uh, you know, he, he, he has a season that for him is terribly disappointing. But he still manages to hit 295, 29 homers, 114 RBIs, 930 OPS, mm. um, you know, a season that today anyone would be proud of. And he did it now. And I should point out, he never missed a game. He kept his consecutive game streak going all through that 1938 season while playing with a disease that constantly is melting your muscles away so that he's getting weaker and weaker by the day and, and never quits, never gives up and still puts together this incredible performance that you know, helps to carry the team to the World Series. And he never went to the doctor in 38? No, uh, at the end of the season, he did. And doctors said they thought maybe it was gallbladder trouble. Um, they ch uh, suggested he change his diet. And, um, you know, that was fairly typical at the time. Unless you were a neurologist, you'd never heard of ALS. And um, there was no reason that Gehrig would, would think that he needed to go see a neurologist. Um, so he went to, you know, a few doctors who all just took their best guess at what, what might be causing him to, to show the, this kind of weakness. I guess Garrett's initial response was, I just got to work harder. That's that right. was always his answer. Work That's harder, right. and get better. That, that had gotten him very far, you know, all of his life because he was not, a, a, you know, the most graceful athlete. He worked hard to overcome his, his weaknesses. And, and, and I think it was also painful to him that, um, people like Babe Ruth and, and reporters were criticizing him saying that, you know, the reason he was slumping in 38 was because he refused to take a day off and that he had put the streak. Uh, he was very proud of his consecutive game streak that he was putting that ahead of his team. And, and Gehrig took that very personally. He, he really, he was, he, it made him angry, um, you know, because here was Ruth who missed games all the time because he was hung over or, you know, because he was hospitalized with a sexually transmitted disease. And um, Gehrig's saying, you know, who are you to call me out? Um, and, 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 you know, it could be that he, you know, he might've benefited from a, a day off from time to time, but it, that's not what was causing his, his troubles in 38, that's for sure. Finally, it's late spring of 39 when he decides to go to the Mayo Clinic I'm curious, was that Eleanor pushing him to do that? Or was this something he decided on his own? 
Yeah, Eleanor had been pushing him for some time to go to the Mayo Clinic. She'd arranged appointments for him and Gehrig was putting it off. He kept thinking that if he just, you know, one day he's going to wake up and this is going to be gone. It's like a virus. It's just going to pass. And then he finally pulled himself from the lineup, continued to travel with the team. And, and again, felt like if he just takes a couple of days off any day now, it's just going to, it's just going to kick in. He's going to feel better. And um, then, you know, he played one last time in an exhibition after pulling us off from the lineup. He, the Yanks were in Kansas city. And um, you know, back then uh, when they had the occasional day off, the, the team would try to squeeze a little bit more money out of them and, and ask them to perform in an exhibition. So they were playing in Kansas city against the, uh, the minor league team. And Gary asked if he could play. Um, again, hoping that maybe just getting back out there, he'd start to feel better. And he went out there and got knocked down by, you know, a routine line drive. He just, you know, he, he caught the ball and, you know, and it, it, and, and he, and it just knocked him, knocked him back off the field and he just knocked him down and, and he just walked off the field. He just, he was so humiliated. And so, uh, and it's probably just so worried, you know, what is wrong with me? What is going on with my body? And that's when he finally decided that he'd better go to the Mayo Clinic and see if they could figure this out. Um, it was, you know, he could no longer put it off. Do we know if he traveled out to Rochester, Minnesota by himself or did Eleanor go with him? No, he flew alone to Rochester and, and spent um, the better part of a week there, if I remember correctly, meeting with the doctors and being examined. And basically the first doctor who saw him was one of the world's leading experts on ALS. And as soon as Gehrig, um, took off his shirt, the doctor knew it was ALS. And hmm. because that's such a horrible di diagnosis, they spent the next part of the week looking, praying that it was something else, trying to find some other explanation. Um, but by the time they were done, they had become you know, 100% certain that, that what he had was ALS. And they, they explained to him what this meant. They explained to him that there was no beating it, that no one had ever survived. But there were also some new treatments um, being explored, including uh, a doctor at the Mayo Clinic that was using histamines, um, another doctor um, in New York who was experimenting with vitamin E, and that there was a chance. Um, and, you know, that's human nature to want to give your patients a chance and to give them something, some hope to cling to. And uh, they wanted to give Gary, you know, optimism that it was not 100% um, fatal diagnosis, but that nobody had ever beaten this before. And that leads into my next question. And I've, I've always wondered about this. Did Lou know that he was dying or was it a case? And maybe this was typical of the way doctors were at the time. Cause I know in my own situation, as recently as the 1980s, my mother was diagnosed with cancer and we were told it was terminal, but the doctor actually told my father that we think it's better not to tell your mother or my mother about the prognosis. It's better to give people some hope. Now we don't do that in the medical community anymore today, but I'm, I'm guessing that may have been a common thing. Do you think Lou, was it hidden from him that this was gonna be fatal? Did he have a sense? What, what do you feel, Does it? What, what's your grasp of that? My my sense is that, and I, and I interviewed um, one of the doctors who had trained with the doctor who treated Gehrig, and he said this doctor um, would never um, deceive or mislead a patient. He would tell you that this was a fatal disease, that, that ALS was something that killed its, its uh, victims, that, that, that you know, you know, nobody survived it. But there are new opportunity, new treatments available. And, you know, you, maybe you'll be the first one who survives it. And, and then we see in the letters that Gehrig wrote to his doctor, and we see the letters that get that Eleanor wrote to the doctor, that Eleanor is encouraging the doctor to deceive Lou. She's saying, we, we must lie to him. We must try to give him false hope. Um, even if it's, even if we know that it's not true, we must try to keep his chin up, give him something to, 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 to believe in. Um, for his own sake. And, and it's important to remember that um, it's human nature. You know, we all want to believe that we're going to be the, the, the one who beats this. And it, and it does help you fight. I think there's a good reason why doctors would say, let's not tell this patient that it's fatal, um, mm -hmm. because you want them to um, continue to have that optimism that they can. And, and that's helpful. That's I think it helps with the, with the, the course of the disease and helps with the treatment. And at the same time, um, it, you know, it, it gives even the family members, you know, a, a, 
a hope that, that maybe they'll be the exception to the rule here, or maybe the doctors got it wrong, or maybe this new treatment will be the answer and, and you'll be the first one on, on whom it works. So I think all of that is, is going into this. In doing your research for the book, you uncovered a series of letters from Garrick to his doctor. I believe the name was Dr. Paul O'Leary. And those letters really gave us some insight into what was going on in Garrick's mind. Yeah, and I, if you can look over my shoulder, you'll see there's a picture on my wall of Gehrig with Dr. O'Leary and Frank Sinatra at mm. the uh, World Series in Cincinnati in 39, I guess that would be, yeah. Um, and um, finding those letters was was a, a huge moment in my life because nobody had, had um, ever reported on them before. Gehrig wrote these letters to Dr. O'Leary um, and Dr. O'Leary had saved the letters. He'd also saved copies of his letters to Gehrig and those letters... Um, became public in the late 1990s. They were, arc, they were sold at an auction and I was able to track them down and get the person who had purchased them to allow me to, to read them and make copies. And, what, and, and they revealed the course of Gehrig's illness in a way that nothing had before. So, you know, the, the part of the problem for me when I began the book was that, you know, Gehrig's story pretty much ended after he walked off the field on the 4th of July, 1939. We didn't know what happened to him for the next two years of his life. And these letters um, told us that in, you know, in sometimes painful detail, you know, he would write to the doctor about, you know, everything that was going on in his body, how much he could move his thumb, uh, you know, how much he could move his feet. Um, he would include handwriting samples so the doctor could see how, his, how his, his hand was performing. And then after a while, he couldn't even provide the handwriting samples and he couldn't even sign the letter. He started yeah. using a stamp. Um, so those letters that turned out to be 200 pages, almost 200 pages of, of letters, um, wow. really, um, changed my, my whole story, changed my perception of Lou and really, I think helped, um, people better understand just how, how brave he was and what he went through in those last two years. Didn't at some point Lou write to his doctor and say, basically, give it to me straight doc. Let yeah. me know what's, how bad is this? Yeah. He says, I'm not going to be a crybaby. Um, I can handle it. I see what's happening to my body and um, I'd rather you just told me the truth. And, um, you know, the doctors were really doing their best to balance that, to try to continue to give him something to, to hope for um, while being straight with him. And, and um, you know, there were, there were new treatments being, um, you know, researched all the time. And, and, you know, Gehrig was a, was part of a study on vitamin E and um, you know, it was published in one of the medical journals that, that it really seemed to be working. So there was, there was, you know, a reason to believe that 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 he might have some some hope. Yeah, let's talk about this Lou Gehrig Day, Fourth of July, nineteen thirty nine. That remarkable speech that he makes. Let me ask you point blank, Jonathan. Do you think that's the greatest speech we've ever seen from uh, not only a baseball player but anybody associated with the game of baseball? I would certainly say so. What do you think? Yeah, I think it's the greatest speech in baseball history. It's it's maybe the greatest speech in American sports history. And I think it belongs on the list of greatest American speeches, period. Mm. Um, because um, it, for, for a bunch of reasons. One is that it comes from a guy who hadn't spoken much. He was a mystery to his fans. And it comes at a moment when he is at his lowest, when uh, he didn't want to speak. He didn't even want this, this ceremony to take place. This was not written by a public relations um, office. This was not written um, by, um, you know, by the, by the Yankees. He gets mm -hmm. up there um, really after saying, I'm not going to talk. You can pack up the microphones. He, Joe McCarthy shoves him to the mic and, and he speaks from the heart. And, and what makes it so beautiful is that it's really in character with Lou. He doesn't talk about himself. Mm -hmm. He says, you know, you may have been hearing about a bad break, um, but I'm lucky. I'm the luckiest man on the face of the earth because I got to be a baseball player. I got to play with these wonderful men you see standing beside me. Uh, even my opponents are here today to, to honor me. How lucky is that? And he goes on to list everything that he had to be thankful for. And, and what that says, I think, to people today, um, not just people with ALS, but to anybody going through a hard time, anybody who's lost someone they love or anybody who's facing a, you know, a hardship, is that you, 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 you have a choice. You can look at the, the bad break or you can look at the life that you've been given and um, and appreciate all of the good things that you have. And that's that's what that speech is all about. It's a it's a it's a speech of hope, a speech of courage. And that's why I think it resonates so much today. 
That's amazing to me, Jonathan, that he didn't even want to speak that day. I did not know that. Yeah, right before the uh, speech begins, the MC says, uh, Mr. Gehrig has, has spoken, has told us that he's too moved today to speak. Hmm. And they start packing up the microphones. They start rolling up the wires and the crowd starts chanting, we want Lou, we want Lou. And, you know, the mama's boy just can't bear to disappoint. And he, he, he can't let the crowd um, down in that way. And he just, you can see in that picture, you know, he, he scratches his head, he rolls his shoulders and he's, uh, you know, okay, I guess I got to do this. And then he does it. And it doesn't look like he had any notes. No, no notes. Um, there's some debate as to whether he had, you know, written this out beforehand in case he had to speak. But um, my hunch, just based on if you if you if you look at what he had to say that day, my guess is that he may have thought about thought about it, but he he clearly was not um, working from a script. Yeah. Amazing. We have a few minutes remaining with uh, Jonathan Eig, who's offering us some terrific perspective on the great Lou Gehrig, uh, on this Lou Gehrig Day here in 2021. If you have questions for Jonathan, I highly encourage you to submit them in our Zoom group chat. We've already had a few questions already. Uh, let's uh, go to a question that came into us from James Lawyer. Uh, he wants to know a little bit more about the wedding of Lou to Eleanor. He understands it was a very small, modest affair. Is that true, Jonathan? Yeah, it was. It's kind of strange. Um, here he is, the captain of the team, and I think only one guy from the team came to the wedding. I'm guessing only one guy was invited. That was Bill Dickey, and um, the wedding was held at um, Eleanor's house, Eleanor's aunt's house on Long Island, and um, you know, Christina and and uh, and Heinrich were there. So at least there was uh, one moment when the family all came together. And there are some beautiful pictures. And I guess that there were no more than 25 or 30 people there. Interesting that Babe Ruth was not there. Maybe they thought he'd be a bit disruptive. Yeah, I think that the, <laughs> they were still on the outs at that point. And um, oh, yeah. OK. Yeah. And again, you know, Gary didn't even invite, you know, his, his manager uh, or, you know, the owner of the team. It was truly a very small wedding. Yeah. You said earlier that. Uh, Lou, for all of his great qualities, didn't necessarily like to spend a lot of money. Maybe that was a factor, too. Didn't want a big wedding. Yeah, that could be a factor. Uh, he was definitely yeah. a cheapskate. Didn't tip the newspaper. I think I interviewed the uh, the guy who used to deliver newspapers to his house in uh, in Westchester, and the guy said Gehrig never tipped. Really? Interesting. You know, it's a relatively minor point, but it does lead into something. When you set out with a goal to write about such an heroic figure, such a great person, such a role model. Are you almost afraid to find out even small things that might be a little bit negative about that person? Were you concerned about that going in? Yeah, it, it's always a concern um, because you, you know you want to like the guy. You're going to spend three or four years of your life every day with him. You know he, he's going to haunt you in your dreams, and and it'd be nice if you if you really admired the guy and found nothing wrong. And especially when I found Gehrig's letters, uh, you know, I really, it occurred to me, A, he could be depressed, he could be angry, he could, you know, sort of betray all of the wonderful, warm emotions that he showed in the speech. Or worse, you know, he could reveal himself as being, you know, a racist or an anti-Semite or, you know, a, a, a Brooklyn Dodger fan, for God's sake. Um, you just don't know what you're going to get. And, and certainly with some of the people I've written about, with Muhammad Ali, for example, there were some really dark um, elements to that story that I was un, that I was unhappy about having to include in my book, but I felt like, you know, if you're going to be honest, if you want your reader to trust you, you can't pull any punches. You've got to, you know, give them the good with the bad. And, you know, if the worst thing I could say about Gehrig is that he was cheap and uh, maybe a little too attached to his mom, um, I, I think he 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 came through pretty well. Yeah, absolutely. Um, not a question, but a comment from Steve Sankner. I always thought it was quite ironic that former Yankee pitcher Jim Catfish Hunter uh, passed away from ALS. Uh, as I recall, Catfish was diagnosed back in the mid-1990s, uh, passed away a couple of years later. I'm curious if you talked to anybody in the Hunter family about his struggle. 
No, I didn't speak to anybody in, in the Hunter family. Um, you know, there's been a, a fairly large number of ALS cases among professional athletes, um, football in particular. There were some theories that you know, there could have been something being used in the, in the fertilizer on, on grass and grass fields that could have caused it. There were also high incident rates among um, Gulf War veterans. So we still don't really know, um, you know, many, uh, I think about a quarter of all ALS cases, or maybe it's a little less than that, are, are considered to be genetic. But even then, there's something that usually triggers it. And we still don't really know if there's a common cause behind any of these cases. A few months ago, we lost Pete Frades, who was a remarkable young athlete at Boston College, ended up living with the disease for quite a long time before he passed away. Did you follow his story pretty closely? Yeah, I, I got to know Pete a little bit through email, and um, and he's absolutely one of the great heroes of the ALS community. Uh, Steve Gleason today in New Orleans is another one, but I've also gotten to know you know dozens and dozens of ALS patients um, who um, don't get that kind of a, attention and are out there fighting not just for themselves but to raise money um, to, to 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 raise awareness. Um, ALS seems to strike the uh, the strongest people, um, and I think that's part part of why it's so important that they honor Gehrig um, in this way because he's a symbol of strength. Um, it's a disease that melts your muscles away, but they but the people with ALS find other sources of strength, and just as Gehrig did. One other major league player I'm aware of that was diagnosed with ALS, uh, Ben Petrick, who was a catcher with the Rockies. Um, I want to say back in the 1990s and seems that ALS may have been a factor in his career coming to an end. Um, um, of course, he obviously had to stop playing and I, I haven't really kept up with his situation, but he is another player, a former major league player diagnosed with the disease. Uh, final question for Jonathan and uh, boy, I wish we had another hour or two because you really had some great insight here. But as we look at this first ever Lou Gehrig day, June 2nd, 2021, if there's one thing that you hope young fans take from a day like this in learning about Garrick, maybe for the first time, what do you hope those kids come out of this with? What do you hope is their number one lesson? Wow, that's a tough question. Um, you know, baseball did so much for Garrick and it's done so much for this country. It's helped us in so many ways. Um, it's helped us to, to integrate and the Jackie Robinson story illustrates. Um, and, and Gehrig's story just reminds us that we are all going to face some, some tragedy in our lives. We are all going to lose loved ones. We are all going to die someday. And Gehrig showed us a way to do that um, with the same kind of courage and determination that he showed on the field. And I think um, that's the beauty of his story, that, that it's, it's a story of strength um, and a story of you know, how to live your life um, for whatever amount of time you have left. And, and I think that um, it's a lesson that we'll, you know, he can never stop teaching us. Well, you say it's a tough question, but you answered it very well. So I, I think you answered it Thanks. perfectly. Uh, just to end on a bit of a lighter note, you <laughs> sent me this picture that you uh, had taken at Yankee Stadium a few years ago at one of the offices there. And there you are posed with Lou Gehrig's bat, and um, you're really enjoying yourself here. <laughs> I think you can tell from that picture that I, there's still a lot of the, uh, the, the eight-year-old Yankee fan in me. Uh, I'm grinning like a little kid, and uh, it's still a thrill for me to be associated in any way with Lou Gehrig and with the Yankees. And the chance to, to hold one of his bats, you can just tell, you can see right there, it just lit me up. It still does. Absolutely. Again, the book that Jonathan wrote initially in 2005, but still in print, uh, Luckiest Man, The Life and Death of Lou Gehrig. You can find it at a number of sites, Amazon.com, BarnesandNoble.com, also at Jonathan's personal website, uh, which is JonathanIg.com. And uh, we're very grateful that John took some time off because he's been working very hard on his next biography, uh, working on a daunting task, writing about the career and the life of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., uh, you're hoping that will maybe come out in a couple of years, 2023. Uh, we wish you the best of luck. We look forward to seeing that. And we do really appreciate uh, your insights over this past hour. It's been tremendous, Jonathan. Thanks, Bruce. This is fun. Jonathan Ig, author, uh, author of Luckiest Man, The Life and Death of Lou Gehrig, one of baseball's true icons. We're very appreciative, Jonathan, for joining us on Lou Gehrig Day 2021. 
We thank the uh, Ford Motor Company for their generous support of today's program. We thank all of you for watching and listening as well. Have a great day, everybody. Take care.